Sarah, let's, uh, let's take on a topic that you've written about recently. Um, your uh, third book with Fiona is The Christ Who Heals, and um, it, it dives in uh, deeply into the, what you regard as the Restoration's contribution or what should be its contribution in some ways to our understanding of atonement. Latter-day Saints didn't invent the word. Um, this, is, this is part of the long Christian tradition. Uh, what's at stake for Latter-day Saints in this conversation? Well, <clears throat> atonement is the center, the foundation of everything that we believe and aspire to be as disciples. It's also the least theologized concept in Mormon doctrine, which is ironic. Uh, I think it's highly significant that, uh, that James Talmadge, as you well know, mm -hmm. when he wrote his, his magnum opus on Jesus the Christ, you, if you turn there to say, okay, so how does he explain atonement? <laughs> and his answer is, we don't know, right? In yeah. some way, inconceivable, beyond human comprehension, he assumed the sins of the world. Yeah. And so any conversation that I'm in about atonement, I would preface by saying, I don't know. Um, I don't know. But as I try to grapple with it as a theological concept, I think that Mormonism precludes certain ways of thinking about it and invites certain other ways of understanding it that set it apart maybe from how it's been understood historically. I mean, what comes to us, after all, is a... Is a long tradition, some would argue an overwrought tradition of kind of theories of atonement in the Christian tradition, uh, ranging yeah. all across the board, um, but didn't develop at once and didn't necessar necessarily develop early. Right. And so what, what, what Christians for uh, hundreds and even thousands of years were working on, how exactly am I saved? How does God's son's sacrifice relate yeah. to me? Um, all of that is kind of an inheritance in, in Latter-day Saint lives and texts. That's right. And it's an inheritance that is predicated on assumptions that we reject, right? Say more about that. Yeah. Well, like original sin. If we begin with a universal condition of sinfulness and damnation, then atonement is what rescues us from that condition. Yeah. But if as Latter-day Saints we believe that the fall was an ascent, that Eve and Adam made the right decision, and that we are not partakers in any way of any guilt that may or may not inhere in that decision, then obviously we have to reconstitute atonement on completely different bases. So that's the first point of difference. Second, I think it would be pointed out, and, and correct me here to the extent that I'm wrong, but, but most early theologies of atonement are, are, are rooted around notions of, of penal substitution or some kind of substitution, usually penal substitution, meaning yeah. that Adam affronted God. He committed an offense against truth, purity, goodness. A penalty must ensue. Justice requires that. And so somebody has to bear the punishment for that. And that has been so dominant in the history of thinking about atonement that one recent theologian who wrote a collection of essays on atonement theology concluded this is a barbaric idea whose time has passed and Christianity should just jettison it. Mm. Because notions of a kind of collective guilt and of Christ bearing a punishment imposed by an arbitrary principle is so incompatible with our modern ideas, our sensibility of, of fairness, goodness, justice, of fairness and justice, of, yeah. that I, I would agree with him. And so as I've gone through the Book of Mormon and tried to learn what does the Book of Mormon have to say about atonement, my personal understanding that I've come to is that it reframes atonement in terms of consequences, not punishment. And that may seem like splitting hairs, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a huge, huge distinction. In other words, Latter-day Saints are rooted in the idea that, 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 that human history begins with a debate about agency and the place of agency in our eternal existence. And agency, as I understand agency, is, requires an understanding that freedom is only 
is only genuine freedom when it is wedded to a consequence. If I make a choice, but the consequence attached to that may or may not ensue, then that isn't really choice. If I say, eat your vegetables and you can watch TV to my child, and the child eats vegetables, and I say, well, I changed my mind, then I've nullified any choice that was there. So I, my understanding of the war in heaven is that what was at stake was the integrity of freedom insofar as there had to be a guarantee that choice was meaningful and valid insofar as it would eventuate in consequences. And I think that's what the Book of Mormon is saying in 2 Nephi 2 about, yeah. you know, God lays this all out. He lets us know what the consequences are. There's a law that, that, that gives us direction and guidance. And, and B.H. Roberts wrote about this. And he said it was essential for the government of the universe that there be an assurance that choice eventuates in consequence. But because the playing field is uneven, because we never operate with perfect knowledge, because we are encumbered by genetics and history and peers and, and, and all of these weaknesses of the flesh, we never make a choice in the full light and understanding of what that choice represents. And I think that is what allows Christ to intervene and say, I don't have to, you don't have to be fully accountable for that choice because there were all of these mitigating circumstances. But consequences have, yeah. to, have to follow naturally in the wake of these choices. And I offer myself vicariously to suffer the consequences of those choices. Mm. So it's quite, a, it's quite a bit different uh, in your telling, say, than um, a, a doctrine of what uh, our Protestant friends might call imputation. Right. The idea that, that Christ's righteousness kind of covers our Persist. failing in a way. Um, th this is very different. By, by, by tying atonement to agency, you're, you're talking about the ultimate transformation of the human person, but not in some kind of passive way, but that what the atonement does is secures uh, the possibility that my agency actually has... You're, you've got it exactly. Okay. You've got it exactly. I'm hearing you then. You've got it exactly, okay. yeah. yeah. And that's why Mormons can't believe in grace in the sense in which Protestants do. Because for Protestants, it's a substitution. It's a defeatist doctrine that says, I can never conform to those standards of holiness or goodness or rightness. And so God will judge Christ instead of me. We have passages of Scripture that that could lead to a kind of imputation sense for LDS understandings of atonement. I'm thinking of Doctrine and Covenants section 45, for right, instance. Right, right. But, but what you're laying out here, I mean, and, and this, is, this is a debate, too, that happens within Christianity. And that, the question for, for some Protestants, and these have been heated fights, are does Christ declare me righteous because of his own righteousness? Yeah. And it, or does he make me right? And this is where the, right. the Methodists and the, yeah, the followers yeah. of John Wesley kind of push back it. And, there, there might be some Eastern Orthodox influences yeah, here yeah. by way but of but the, the Germans Saints, and so on. It's Latter day Saints, we have to say, no, no, no. We utterly reject both of those. Hmm. If we believe that, that salvation consists of li living a godly life after the manner of Christ, and, and Joseph Smith taught or countenanced, right, the lectures yeah. on faith, one of which says, where, where will we find what it means to be saved? Christ. Christ is a saved being. Why is he a saved being? Because he is perfectly holy. How do we become a saved being? We have to become perfectly holy. God can't make someone holy. God can coach and forgive and, and teach and instruct and mentor and influence and inspire. Yeah. But those consequences are still there. And that's why, as you said, the atonement is what enables us to keep trying, to keep struggling, to keep reforming yeah. and conforming ourselves to the pattern of godliness. But, you know, section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verses 34, 35, 36, are very, very emphatic. They say you can only be sanctified by law. By law. And, and what that means is that we're not rewarded for law, but it means to live in harmony with these divine precepts is the only way that we can... You can only be chased by being chased. Yeah. 
What what would you say to some to a Latter Day Saint who says, "Well, this this sounds like it's all on me again," and I've, I I I felt like I've needed saving. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I, I've tried. I'm struggling. I'm, I'm I'm going up the hill, and I can't ever seem to get it right. And uh, it gives me hope to think that I've got kind of divine help, and 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 that this might make me feel, man, like I, I'm I'm still just it's all on me still. Yeah. Well, I, I think the promise of the Lord, right? I've graven thee on my palms, right? Yeah. I will never forsake you. I think what he's saying is, you know, I'm I'm the ever faithful tutor. I will stick with you through thick and thin until we get through this. He plays the long game with us. He in plays other words. the long game with us. <laughs> yeah. And um, this is why, you know, I've, I've I've often referred to the, you know, the the verse in the Book of Mormon where, where Christ refers to our woundedness. And I think his promise is that he will heal us of these wounds and deficiencies and errors and harm we incur and inflict on ourselves and others. But there's no shortcut. And that's why, you know, Joseph said, you know, that, that it'll be thousands of years after we pass through the veil before we learn the things. And I don't think he meant cognitively learn. I think he meant before we acquire, experientially. we experientially learn and acquire those habits of holiness. That, and that reframes our experience here on earth as well, doesn't it? Is that um, there is deep purpose in being in a family where you can't quite comprehend that sibling or that son or that parent and where you struggle against yeah, the gaps yeah. between us and the brokenness of... No, absolutely. That, that there's deep purpose here. Absolutely. One of my favorite quotations from Brigham Young, you don't hear often, is, is he said, the purpose of the gospel is to bring out every weakness, sin, and infirmity in your, in your person so that it can be purified by the fire of the gospel. Mm -hmm. So we're meant to rub up against each other and irritate and aggravate and infuriate each, so that we can be... Purified. It also gives deep and profound meaning to all suffering, all experience, all the harrowing nature of our of our lives. It's because it's not easy to transform people like us into godly beings. So by framing it the way you did, it's not to remove divine help from human striving. In any way. But it's to reformat human striving as purposeful, transformative. Yeah. Exalted yeah. eventually. Yeah. yeah, in this context, I really love the definition of sin that Charles Taylor gives, which he says, sin is our refusal to cooperate with God in the sanctifying effect mm. of suffering. So it's a cooperative venture where God aids us, strengthens us along the way. Heals us, as you said. Heals said. us. And makes possible makes it possible for us to rechoose and rechoose, and that's how when I read the word repentance, that's always what I'm seeing in my mind. Repentance means to rechoose, to rechoose, because until our choices are right, we're not going to experience the consequences, the fruits. This that's is fascinating to me because you're, you're marking out a path that is is not the classic Christian heresy of God gave you moral faculties to choose right, so do it. Right, Pelagian and, and, yeah, and if you don't, then it's your own fault because you can you yeah. see things clearly. God gave you that, so so do it. Yeah. Be that moral being and perfect yourself. It's, this is not what you're arguing for. No. But it's also not that other that 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 passive sense either of I wait for God's effect on me, and I passively receive whatever He'll give, and um, his, his, the righteousness covers mine, and I remain. Yeah, essentially the, sinful the, and saved. Yeah, yeah. The only thing that, that, that moves either. gestures in the direction of passivity is the surrender of our will to His. In the in the in the sense that we have to have that faith that okay, I'll do it your way because my way isn't working. Mm -hmm. But it's still an exertion of the will in in that way. And and I would just say in terms of the hopefulness that I think the restoration. Uh, brings us in this regard is, is really was there latent all in, in the Sermon on the Mount all along. And um, in, in Matthew, as he's ending the Sermon on the Mount, we, we translate in the King James Version, be ye therefore perfect, right? But, but that's not the, the reading of the original Greek. The original Greek is, therefore, ye shall be whole. It's a future tense verb. And the word isn't perfect, it's whole. And so the way I read that is he's given this, this beautiful litany of challenges, right? You know, be meek and be humble and submit yourselves to persecution and, and, and practice love and charity. And if you do all these things, trust me, you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. You're going to be whole one day. It's a beautiful promise. It's beautiful.